So we'll dive straight in. Those are the four questions we want to try and answer in these 45 minutes. Um, so let's look at the first question, what am I? What I want you to do on this, uh, this page is draw a big circle. Just draw a big circle. Now, there are no right or wrong answers, so you can relax, okay? No right or wrong answers. What I want you to do is to think in your mind how many component parts are there to a human being. So, how many parts make up a human being? And then, once you have decided in your mind how many parts there are, Within the circle, draw how you would represent a human being according to those parts. So, we would all say we're physical, we're spiritual. How many other parts do you think there are? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then, using some creativity, how would you draw that within the circle? Okay? So, I'm going to give you two minutes to complete that, and I will time you exactly. Two minutes starting now. Go ahead. Okay, time is up. Now if we had time, you would be able to share your creations with the people around you and to show what, what you have. But in the interest of time, how many of you said that we're only two parts? Let me see your hands. One person that says we're only two parts, so physical, spiritual, yeah? That's basically what we are, okay? That's fine. How many people said we're three parts? Three parts, okay. Here's a man with a Mercedes cap. Let me hear your three. Physical, mental, and spiritual. So, he says we're physical, mental, and spiritual, all right? I guess that's basically the others, yeah? How many said we're at least four parts? Oh, there's some people with four as your closest. Let me hear your four. Social, okay, so he added social to the others that we had. Uh, how many said we're five? Okay, here's somebody with five. What did you add or what was different? Emotional, so she added emotional to those other four. Anybody say we're six? Is somebody saying six? Artists, art, an artistic element, that we're artistic, okay, yeah. Anybody say seven? No more than seven. Okay, so do you have seven? Eight, okay. What, what are the other parts that you've added? Just shout out, let's hear. Okay, philosophical, rational, and chemical. All right, anybody have more than eight? All right, so we generally, uh, as I said, there's no right or wrong, okay? So it's, it's what you think. So I generally say that we're made up of five parts. doesn't mean to say it's right, but uh, the five that I've put down are big, and this is how I would draw it. Um, basically because when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest law? He says, to love God with all your heart, which I would say is emotional, all your soul, which is a spiritual, all your mind, which is intellectual, your strength, which is the physical, and your neighbor as yourself, which is social. So I would say there's five parts, at least, to a human being. Um, and those, that's just my proposal. And we're going to look at these uh, a little bit closer. The problem is, let's say we're created with five parts. Sin has messed up the wiring. In other words, sin as a condition, not the things we do, but as a condition, has rewired us so that the parts don't function according to how they were originally intended. In my estimation, we're intended to live from our spirit, and that is meant to govern all that we do. But sin has kind of messed up all of that. And, you know, the Bible speaks about us being sinful, um, dead in sins and transgressions, what we want to do, we don't do, and what we don't want to do, that's what we end up doing. And, and so it, it's, it's messed up the whole thing. So what we need then is a transformation. Um, so, 
what, what happens, as I see it, within sin is we get driven by all the other component parts except the spiritual, the physical. Many people are driven by their physical desires. That's why there are so many addictions in the world. Because we get so easily trapped by our physical drives. And they take over and they dictate the whole of life. I was listening to a, a radio program um, not too long ago in England. And they were talking about the problem of alcohol consumption in people who are over 60. So the elderly. And this was a phone-in program, so people could phone in and give their experiences of what's going on in their lives. One lady phoned in and she said, yeah, I have a, a bit of a problem with alcohol consumption. She said, I drink two bottles of vodka before lunch. Each day. Uh -huh. And then she said, I know it's not good for me, but I can't help it. What's happened? The physical has taken over control. That is driving everything in her life. And all the, 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 um, the addictions that we can suffer from are basically the physical taking over control. That's part of our problem because of sin. You've got also the intellectual, there are those who are very intellectual driven. They don't want to hear anything about anything that may be spiritual or anything like that. They must have hard and fast facts, scientific evidence for everything that you talk about. Driven very much by just evidence based that they can see and, yes, uh, verify with their senses. I'm sure you've spoken to people that are very intellectually driven in all that they do and uh, almost have no space for example for emotion in their lives so there are those that are very intellectually driven of course the social side of us has an enormous effect on who we are now i would say that uh, christians and the reason why i draw the social as a triangle is because i believe there are three we believe in three-way relationships as Christians. Most other people believe that the social relationships we have is just one-on-one. -on -one. Christians don't believe that. You know, as Paul says, uh, we love because he first loved us. It's a three-way, always. Our relationships are three-way. But the social can really take over in a person's life. Most of us have ethnic back... No, that's wrong. All of us have an ethnic background. And without realizing it, it has an enormous effect on us. I was the pastor at Newbold Church in England for 11 years. At Newbold, we have at least 50 different nationalities gathered each Sabbath. It's about a thousand people or so gathered at worship. Can you imagine the uh, the expectations of people from different backgrounds coming to church. So many times I had people saying, that's wrong, you shouldn't be doing it like that. Why was that? Because they were used to, from their home, doing it in another way. The social background in which we grow up has an enormous impact on how we live today. Teens in particular, social, the social drive is very strong. What my peers are doing and meaning has an enormous effect on how we would live our lives today. So the social can often be the main driving force in our lives. Um, there are those, of course, who are much more, if you want to put it this way, emotionally driven. Where, and again, the teenage years where the hormones are kicking in and, it's, and, and something's going on inside our bodies and, and that starts dictating so much of what we do. Having been a pastor for so many years, I've done a lot of premarital counseling. And the challenge with that is when people are in love, they don't hear anything you say. When those emotions kick in, it doesn't matter how much you're talking to people. 
Something else is driving the life. Emotions have an enormous impact on us. Very strong driving force. And sometimes that can be the main driver in our lives, or even all four of them. And then, of course, at the center of who we are then is meant to be the spiritual. And sin has caused that this is basically unknown in most of us. We're driven by everything else except the spiritual side of who we are. So that's my proposal for, for who we are. Okay. And because we are so messed up then, what we need is some kind of conversion uh, event to happen in our lives. Because we naturally aren't seeking God, it has to come from outside us. That first initial impulse will not be generated within us. It's got to come from outside. So I would say what's needed, first of all, is a new thought from somewhere that disturbs the way in which we're living that says there actually is a God, a God who loves me, who cares for me, who actually died so that I could be saved. That thought is not something that comes from within, it comes from without. That's why the preaching of the gospel is so important. That's why witnessing is so important. It's a thought from outside of me that comes to me. And that basically is the content of the gospel. Now, when that thought really takes place in me, it actually generates some feeling, some emotion, something towards this new thought, this God. Oh, I would like to respond to this person, this being. The new emotion comes on. Um, and when you combine the thought with the emotion, before it can ever become personal, you've got to make a choice for it. person has to choose, okay, I want to believe that this is true. I believe that this God actually does exist. And you make that choice, which then leads to a new attitude in the way in which we live. I want to live my life with and for this being. And that then leads to the journey of transformation. So, as we go on to talk about that, just want you to realize, okay, we are saved by the grace of God coming in. The new thought and emotion that comes through His Spirit coming to us from outside us. This isn't works that we do, okay, just so that you realize that. Our salvation comes from the realization that there is a God who loves me, and I respond to that. That then is what I would propose is the pattern of conversion for a Christian. All right, let's go on to the second question then. What does it mean to be spiritual? I'm going to give you two minutes to think of a Bible text that you would use to define what it means to be spiritual based on your understanding of what a human being is. Okay, so take two minutes to... Think of a Bible text that you would, uh, you would uh, use to say this expresses what it means to be spiritual and uh, share it with the pe person next to you. Two minutes starting now. Go ahead. I don't think we're going to have much time to do a lot of feedback on that, but you may want to share that with your neighbors uh, a little bit later. Here's my, uh, my, my text that I use is uh, Romans 8. Just one text at least. Romans 8 verse 14 says, Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. In other words, it's being led by the Spirit. Verse 16 says, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. In other words, the Holy Spirit does his main work in our spirit. That's where he works. Being spiritual is about being driven from your spirit. Not being driven by the physical or the intellectual or the emotional um, or the social, but being driven by the spirit who works in our spirit. It's very interesting when you think about the temptations of Jesus. 
um, how the devil came to him, depending on which gospel you read. But let's take Matthew's. What's the first temptation? Where was Satan tempting him? It was the physical, wasn't it? That was his first temptation, physical. And that's often the temptation that uh, I think many people fall for when the spirit comes, the spirit. It, it, when, when Satan comes, he's tempting our physical. Second temptation, we can perhaps agree or disagree on this one. I would say when he takes him up on the temple and says, okay, since, you say, since you're quoting scripture, let me quote one. <clears throat> um, it says that God will you know, protect you so you won't hurt yourself, so why don't you just throw yourself off of here? I think he's, he's using a kind of intellectual kind of argument there. Since he's quoting Bible, I'll quote as well. So he goes to the intellectual next. But the last temptation that he uses, he goes right to the core, which is spiritual. Worship me. And I think often that's the way in which Satan goes about tempting. He may start with the peripheral, the physical. He may use social, he may intellectual, but what he's really after is the spiritual, the core, what's going on deep within us. Um, and so that's where he really wants to get at, that we would have him and his ways of doing things as the driving force. Or, if we're not getting in touch with our spirit at all, he can keep us on the periphery of life, doing all other kinds of things. Alright, so that's a brief look at that. Um, I would say there are some unhealthy ways in which we do spirituality. An interesting book is by uh, Peter Scazzaro, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. He gives ten symptoms of what unhealthy spirituality is like. These are what he says. Number one, using God to run from God. In other words, being so busy doing things for God, you never take time to just be with God. I think that may be a temptation for us in church often, that we can get so busy doing lots of things in church for God, but how many of us are living from the core of who we are and we minister from the depth of our relationship with God. I think they were talking about that this morning in the, uh, in the talks. Number two, ignoring the emotions of anger, sadness, and fear. Generally within uh, Christian societies, within the church, we are saying you shouldn't be angry, you shouldn't be sad, and you shouldn't be afraid. But they are real emotions. We pretend that we don't have them at our peril. Um, and so he says, you know, when you see somebody who's never, who just smiles all the time, everything's just perfect, never sad, never angry, never afraid, that may be a sign of unhealthy spirituality, because they're not, they're not really in touch with who they are. And we are emotional beings. Number three, dying to the wrong things. Those people who will give you a whole list of things that you shouldn't do that you must die to these things, you must you know, put to death these kind of things within you. Often that's a sign of unhealthy spirituality. Number four, denying the past's impact on the present. In other words, not acknowledging that our childhood and things that have happened before actually do impact how we are today. And it has an enormous impact. So many of us think, oh, I've been converted, so it doesn't matter anymore. That's not necessarily true. Stuff that's happened in the past influences to a great degree what's going on with us here and now. And if you just say, oh, it doesn't really matter, you're heading for trouble. Number five, dividing our lives into secular and sacred. Do you ever think, oh, this is a, this is a, a holy thing I'm doing, but this is a more secular thing. If you are going to be truly spiritual, everything you do, if you're going to be driven from your spirit, is going to be spiritual. 
I remember once I had a church member who was uh, going to celebrate her 60th birthday and uh, she was inviting me to a, a birthday party and she said, you have to come to the one that's at, I think it was like 7 o'clock in the evening. I said, oh, you having two? Yes, I'm having one at 5 o'clock for my secular friends. Oh. Secular and spiritual. Number six, doing for God instead of being with God. It's kind of reflected in number one again. That's one of the, it's a symptom of unhealthy spirituality that you are so busy in doing things for God. And the problem with this is we often end up very proud of what we're doing. And we, we set up standards for this shows that I'm a very holy person because I've been to and I've done and I've attended and all the lists that we can have. We've become very pharisaical. Number seven, spiritualizing away conflict. Trying to deny that conflict ever happens. When two humans get together, there will be conflict because we have different ways of looking at things. Um, and so uh, if you're only going to say, oh, there's no problem, it's, it's okay. Believe me, these things sit very deeply and we need to face conflicts rather than spiritualizing them away. Number eight, covering over brokenness, weakness, and failure. Not admitting that we're not perfect. That, that we're, I mean, we, we put on this nice facade when we come to church every day, and uh, everything's just fine. How many of us admit that we are broken, that we are weak, that we don't have it all together, that we don't manage to do things great? And those that always say, oh, everything's just fine, it's just me and the Lord, and we're just strong in the Spirit, spiritualizing away, covering up brokenness, it's a sign of unhealthy spirituality. Number nine, living without limits. Thinking that you can be anything and all things to all men. And those that get really involved in church often, which is very good, uh, and thinking there's no limit to what they can do, they often end up, unfortunately, burnt out, and cynical because they realize they've gone over their limits and just can't maintain the life that they have. And the final one, judging other people's spiritual journey. That one often happens a lot in church where people judge, oh, you can't be a good Christian because you haven't been to prayer meeting this week or you haven't studied your lesson or you didn't come with your tithes or whatever. Judging other people is a sign of unhealthy spirituality. All right, moving on to the third question then. What practices strengthen spirituality? Um, I would have given you time to, uh, to work in groups on this one, but we won't do that. Let's just shout out. So, what kind of th practices strengthen spirituality, would you say? Prayer, definitely. Reading the Bible, silence, going to church, listening, worship, sharing, mindfulness. Hmm, interesting one. Yeah, yeah, very good. Healthy living, trusting, fasting, fasting. Very good. I would say what we need to understand is the principle of disciplines. Basically all of our lives are lived, if you want to achieve something, you use a discipline to achieve it. A discipline is an activity that you can do now that brings you to a point where you can do something that you're not able to do now just by mere effort. We do it all the time. So, if I want to uh, play the piano, I can't just sit at the piano and try really hard. I've got to do certain disciplines. So I've got to practice, and I've got to do my scales, and I've got to do the, the sight reading and all the rest of it, and in the end I'll be able to play piano. You've got to use disciplines to get you to the place you want to be. Anything we do in life, it's all based on committing to disciplines. And I would say, that's what we need to think of in terms of spirituality. To have spiritual disciplines in our lives 
that help to transform our souls. And the things you were all shouting out are things I would agree with. And it's interesting, each time I've done this, those are the disciplines that people talk about. Um, but there's one I'd like to suggest for you, and I've never heard anybody say it yet. And it's the discipline of rhythm. This is perhaps the thing that we lack the most in our lives. A biblical rhythm. When you uh, look at the creation story, Genesis 1, the first part of Genesis 2, you know, there's a, there's a rhythm. It says, and there was evening and then there was morning, first day. Evening and morning, second day. Evening. Notice the rhythm. And the rhythm is that you work from your rest, not rest from your work. You work from rest, not rest from work. Most of us have a rhythm where we work and we're doing stuff all day long and then we fall in bed completely exhausted and then the alarm goes off too early and then we're up and at it again. We are doing the second part. All we do is just rest from work. Our priority is work. But with God saying, and there was evening and then morning, what comes first? Rest. The working comes from your resting. You don't rest from your work. It's a brilliant idea when you think about it, because that's how our salvation comes to us. Salvation is a gift that we rest in first. And then we do whatever works we do afterwards. We don't work to get our salvation, which is the rest. If we can get this concept into our minds, it would actually transform our lives, I think. Getting the rhythm right. Now, we as Adventists, we do this once a week. We start a day called Sabbath in the evening, and we rest. And then there's the rest of the Sabbath, which is the next day. But what happens is we flip it around come Saturday night, and then Sunday, we start it differently, because then we start from midnight or whenever it is that we start. And we just keep going on with life, and then we, oh yeah, it's Sabbath, let's just turn it around. But actually, if we lived our lives with this principle, we would be concentrating much more on resting first. In other words, start your day in the evening. Start Start by concentrating on resting first. Because the amount of work you can do is based on how well you can rest. I put the, the symbol of the heart up there because the heart, when it's healthy, rests more than it works. It works from its rest. An unhealthy heart beats all the time and needs to be shocked back or helped back into a rhythm where it is supposed to rest. Because the resting phase of the heart is longer than the work phase. God's built this into the whole of nature, that rest comes first. That you start with rest. And imagine if we were able to do that, if we were a group of people that knew how to rest well, and then work. You see, one of the biggest problems, especially in Western society, is stress. It's killing us. We're looking at all kinds of diseases that are stress-related. And I'm sure you know a lot of those. Heart diseases, overweight, all kinds of things. Why? Because we are working ourselves to death and we don't know how to rest. Adventists have a great thing to say to the world. Follow us and we will show you a different rhythm to life in which you work from your rest, where you learn to rest first, and then you work. I mean, how many of you, oh, I guess it's difficult here, get the proper seven, eight hours of sleep at night? And why is it? It's because 
we are trying to rest from work. And we're pushing as much as possible into work, and it squeezes out the rest time. Whereas if we flipped it around, start the day in the evening, and then took it easy, you can sleep in earlier. Sleeping in means going to bed earlier. Rather than, because most of us stay up late, and then sleeping in is to stay up late the next day. What if you did it the other way around? What if you went to bed early? You'd be able to get up early. See, we've got this thing so twisted around. We've missed God's rhythm, I think. And what I'm hoping would happen with us as Christians, as Adventists, is that we would be examples of this to the world. We have something the world really needs to know. People that know how to rest well. In other words, maybe then our devotional time starts in the evening. I started doing this a couple of years ago. Um, and I'm not saying it's easy, because there's so much when it comes to work and the way which pressure is that it does that to you. But actually, when you manage to flip this around, I think it will transform your life. It will enable the other disciplines that you want to use, the Bible study, the prayer, etc. It will enable you to have the time you need when you get the rhythm right. When you look at the way in which uh, Sabbath is introduced in Genesis, God stopped what he'd been doing before. It's a matter of stopping. He rested, delighted in what he'd done. There's also time for contemplation in Sabbath living as well. That's what changes Sabbath from just an ordinary day off. It's a time of meditation, of contemplation, of communion with God. Bringing this rhythm into our everyday lives is what I'd like to propose Adventists are supposed to be known for. Sabbath living, starting with rest, stopping your work, resting from your work, just relaxing, just recouping, delighting. What brings you delight? What just refreshes your soul? and a time of contemplation. Somebody said mindfulness somewhere. Those kinds of things. And somebody mentioned silence, and I just want to end with that, because I think quietness is something we need to build into our lives. These are just a couple of disciplines that I'm suggesting for you. Quietness is another one. The Bible's full of it. How, in order to be strong, Stop up a bit and rest. That's basically what it's saying. I think Isaiah says it very well. In repentance and rest is your salvation. Notice again, salvation comes from resting. In quietness and trust is your strength. We think of strength as activity, as doing stuff. But it's in quietness and trust in the one who's got everything under control. That's where the real strength comes from. And I guess the challenge for us is to, to be able to stop up long enough to be in God's presence long enough to realize, hey, you've got this under control. And so I can actually rest in what you're doing and just join you, Lord, in what you're doing with the world. So, if this is all true, what does this mean for you? And I'm going to leave you to fill that in. Are there some things you're going to have to stop doing? Are there some things you're going to need to start doing? Are there some commitments you're going to need to make? I'd encourage you, actually, if you're going to be doing that, to share them with somebody else. Because it's very easy for us to write it down on a piece of paper. And uh, thank you very much. Finished with... Uh, uh, AYC this year and go away and carry on as we were. But maybe if you share it with somebody, then 
you're a little bit accountable for what it is that you write there now. I'd say you would become spirit-driven, the kind of person that Jesus is trying to make us into. If you remember, you've got to start practicing some disciplines that will get you to the place where Jesus can use you as he wishes. And he wants to transform us to be his people. Thank you very much. Let's just close with a prayer, shall we? Loving God, we thank you for the time we've been able to just spend here together. You have created us in your image. And part of that reflects spirituality because you are spirit. We pray that you would help us to make the commitment to do those practices that will strengthen our spirit. Help us to have a rhythm to life that allows more space for you in our lives. And then as you transform us, may you use us to go and transform the world. Holy Spirit, help us to continue to listen for your voice speaking deep within our souls so that we may know that we are your children. We thank you and bless your name as we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much.